Okay, welcome everybody for our afternoon um, um, Department of Marine Geosciences um, weekly seminar series. Today we are hosting, we are in Italy, and we are hosting Dr. Marcello Nataliccio from the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Torino in Italy. A city with a good chocolate, I guess. Right, mm -hmm. not, not only. <laughs> not only. <laughs> Um, Marcello Natalice is a tenure track researcher as assistant professor at the Department of Earth Sciences of Torino. He obtained his PhD in 2010 at the University of Torino in Italy, and from 2016 to 2017 he got a Marie Curie Fellowship at Hamburg University in Germany. The main research interests are the sedimentology, petrography, and geochemistry of evaporite deposits, and the geo microbiology of ancient sedimentary environments. His most recent research has combined fieldwork and observations at the micro scale with the study of molecular fossils, lipid biomarkers mainly, to unravel the paleoclimate and palo environment during the Mycenaean salinity crisis. So today, uh, Dr. Natalice is going to talk about uh, a million year fluctuance of the west of um no i have a wrong title i will read the title and you put the powerpoint <laughs> okay. I will. so with these words we start um our seminar today Marcelo. yeah so i can start nicolas please go ahead this is the title yeah <laughs> thank you very much for the presentation and especially for inviting me it's a really a pleasure and uh, next time i hope to be in presence and maybe visiting you because it's much better to give this seminar in presence that's online but anyway just start so today i will try to talk about um, the the so no the so no the the Messinian sanity crisis event that it was an event occurred around about six million years ago in the Mediterranean basins, and I would like to give you a perspective from the molecular point of view. But first, I, let me start with a short introduction on this topic, and uh, because uh, I will talk about evaporite, especially gypsum. And evaporite are generally not really studied for their paleontological content, just because they are most likely pre precipitated in evaporitic context in extreme condition and organisms that cannot survive in this condition. But there are some exceptions. And one of these exceptions is like uh, the excellent preservation of life form and also organic compound molecular fossils in some kind of evaporite deposit. This is one of the cases. You can see here a nice fluid inclusion in a light crystals containing some well-preserved, still alive in some case, um, life for. Here we have uh, eukaryote organisms, but also prokaryotes. So if these life form are well-preserved in evaporite, why not molecular fossils that are much more resistant to degradation when after burial. So I will try to give you a little overlook of uh, this kind of compound, so molecular fossils that are molecules produced by different kinds of organisms. So when we study our molecular fossils, we can get information about uh, different kinds of information. So we can get information from organisms that were living in the water column, but we can also have information about organisms that were living at the seafloor of the basin or in the sediments. But we can also have information about lipids or molecular fossils of continental plants just surrounding our studied basin. So at the end, we can, from molecular fossils study, we can get paleoclimatic, paleoenvironmental, and information about ancient marine biota. But coming to the evaporitic deposit, because it's the more or less the focus of this presentation, in modern setting, why molecular fossils are studied for evaporitic deposits? But just because, mostly because in evaporitic setting, uh, the target is to try to understand the resistance of life at, to extreme condition. And lipids can serve as a, uh, as a proof or how much, how much organisms can survive to this extreme condition. And here we have a case, uh, I think it is in Israel, 
is a modern pond with uh, um, the gypsum crust growing on the bottom. Of the, there's a sh shallow water basin. And if you li like to see this different color, these are just because they contain different kinds of microorganisms. And especially the most common microorganisms found here are allophilic archaea, cyanobacteria, and other kinds of bacteria like sulfate reducing bacteria. So all these organisms tolerate different kinds of condition, but especially high salinity condition and low oxygen condition like the sulfate reducing bacteria. But coming to our topic of this, this presentation, so the Messinian salinity crisis. So this event happened six million years ago in the entire Mediterranean basin, as you know, and different kind of evaporative product were precipitated there most likely because uh, many scientists say that there was a, a, a complete desiccation of this basin, so a, a very dramatic uh, sea level fall. But anyway, since the discovery of this uh, evaporate, deep-seated evaporate in the old Mediterranean, and since the formulation of the Messinian salinity crisis concept that was more or less in the 70s, there are still many open points that are still discussed today. And these points are especially about uh, the climate of this event. I mean, how much was the stream the climate during this event? And how much or which kind of extreme condition were present in the water column? And especially if this extreme condition controlled the life and the disappearance of life during the precipitation of evaporite. But there are still a lot of other questions like, the depth of this basin, the basin and the amplitude and the magnitude of the sea level fall. So today in my presentation, I will try to give some um, answer, but I will not answer completely as you will see, but I will try to, to give some insight about on this question using petrographic sedimentological and especially lipid biomarker data set. Just to give an overlook how the sediment look like, the sediment of the crisis look like. These are, these are generally the pre-evaporitic sediment. So before the crisis uh, started, uh, the, the deposition was a cyclical deposition of a Mars, Sapropel, and Ditomachus deposits. And the disappearance of fossils start around about 6.7 million years ago. So just well before, the onset of the crisis, that here is more or less marked by this surface that mark the starting point of gypsum precipitation on the marginal basin. So you can see here this stratigraphic model just foresee two different and just different kinds of basin. The marginal one, one that we have more especially gypsum deposit formed, and the deepest basin that we have more deposit, more kind of evaporative deposit formed. So during the first phase of the crisis, in the marginal basin especially, we have a huge precipitation of um, gypsum deposit. We are in the famous here, we are in the famous Beno del Gesso deposit in Northern Italy, and you can see very nicely cyclical gypsum deposit alternated to fine shale deposits. During the second phase of the crisis, ah, sorry, I forgot to say that today I will focus mostly on this kind of uh, rocks. So I will talk about this kind of formation. But during the second phase of the crisis was characterized mostly by salt and especially allied precipitation, mostly in the deep basin. And here we have a nice example from uh, the Sicily and uh, the Real Monte salt mine, especially. And during the last phase of the crisis, again, Gypsum was the most uh, important uh, evaporitic mineral. In the year, again, we have a, a very cyclical precipitation of gypsum and the mar sediments that close, that close the crisis before the advent or normal of typical normal marine condition. So the three phases of the crisis, they are characterized by different sedimentary product, but different evaporitic product. And one of the still open question is if the climate control the deposition of this different kind of evaporites. So we will especially focus on the Benedict section or especially in the primary lower gypsum 
unit that formed during this first phase of the crisis. So what is known so far from the Messinian uh, uh, deposit in the Mediterranean, especially for the molecular fossil perspective, there are kind of quite, quite a lot of study, but this study comes especially from the marginal basin. You can see it mostly from the Vendel Jesson Piedmont, and but also from the Spain basin and some of Crete and Cyprus. But there are still most many many deposits to be studied, especially the deep one in the central Mediterranean. So I will start to talk about some kind of a compound and the most used compound to characterize the paleoclimate are the long chain and alkanes and the long chain ketones or alkenones. So these compounds are mostly produced by long chain alkane by vegetational vegetation like terrestrial plants. You can see the normal shape of this compound, these molecules. So they provide information about climate, type of, type of vegetation and paleohumidity, especially if we can compare them and we can combine them with their specific carbon and hydrogen isotope. But also alkenone can give information about aquatic algae because they are mostly commonly produced by uh, coccolithophorids. So we can get a lot of information about seawater temperature, polyproductivity and polyhumidity. So this is the first case I will present today. We have a section of the complete crisis. So from the first phase, the second and the third phase and the precipitation of two gypsum unit intercalated by the salt unit. And we like to use here the N-alkane data set. So remember the, the molecular fossil produced by plant. In this case, we use the deuterium, so the hydrogen isotope of an alkane. As you can see here, each molecule of an alkane is composed with a lot of atoms of hydrogen. So looking at this uh, uh, isotopic ratio, we can have information about paleoprecipitation, for instance, or paleohydrology. Just to, be, to look at this figure in a simple way, we can read this figure in this way. So when you have less depleted, values, so less negative values of the hydrogen of an alkane, we cannot be sure that we are in more arid condition on land. When we have very depleted values like this one, we have more humid condition. And another important thing to look at this figure before to look at the data is this blue line. So the blue line are the modern vegetational values today in the northern Mediterranean and in the central Mediterranean here. So what is important in this figure is that the data set of NLK, so the vegetational data from the northern Italy or the northern Mediterranean, they fit quite well with the, with the modern values. You can see from the position of this blue bar. So this means that the first phase of the crisis was mostly characterized by the climate conditions similar to those of today. So mostly a humid hydrologic regime. regime. But during the last phase of the crisis, we have a shift toward more arid condition. So this is very nicely plotted by and figured by the analkane that we have a kind of increase of aridity in the last phase of the crisis. Mm -hmm. I will not have time to talk about alkane, alkenones, so produced by algae, marine algae, but these are also interesting to trace paleoclimatic condition. So, but we can have a look at more detail on the primary lower gypsum unit. And as I told you, the primary lower gypsum unit during the first phase of this dramatic event is characterized by the position of gypsum deposits, like you can see here, very thick gypsum deposit with a lot of different pages, different pages. And these deposits are intercalated with thin layer of Mars or organic rich shades. Like in this case, you can see these are very fluorescent because it's, these deposits are very rich in molecular fossils, in, in, in organic matter. So take, we take an example from Northern Italy. And this example, we have a very nice cyclicity. This is a very well studied in Northern Italy, close where I live today. And this is the polenta section in the Piedmont. And you can see here a very nice cyclicity between gypsum layer and the shale rich layer. 
So we recognize more or less 16 gypsum shale uh, cyclical pattern in this basin. So the assumption is that the cyclicity, the sedimentary cyclicity is driven by the short term climate, uh, climate oscillation like the precession. So if this assumption is correct, the precession um, as a role in producing different kind of lithology, it should be like that the gypsum formed during arid phase and shales, so the inter intercalated shale, most likely formed during humid phases. So we want to demonstrate this using, again, an alkane, because we like to use an alkane, so the lipid produced by plant, you can see this, this, these are the molecular shape of this alkane. And in this case, how we want to trace an alkane for the short term climate is to use the delta C13 values of an alkane. So the delta C13 values, they respond quite well to the type of vegetation and especially to the type of metabolism of vegetational plants or vegetations. So we can recognize more humid plants like the plants with the C3 metabolism that are most likely more depleted in the carbon isotope value of alkane. But if we have more uh, plant, more adapted to climate, uh, hard climate like the C4 plants, we should have less depleted values. So again, if we look at the data set during the first phase of the crisis, we can see that mostly the lot of the sample that we measured, they fall in between the two type of plant, but mostly in the plant uh, of humid, typical of humid condition. So these again show that the vegetational growing around the basin in, in the northern Italy, they were typical, more typical of uh, hydrological, of humid hydrological conditions. So again, this apparently explain us or tell us that we don't have a really extreme condition during the deposition of primary lower gypsum units. But if we look one single cycle, like in this case, you can see this is a cycle composed by shale and gypsum. We have a kind of trend between more humid and more arid phase. So it looks like that the lipids uh, evidence a, very, a change of climate condition and that correspond to the chain or lithological change. But we still don't know if this chain was responsible to the gypsum precipitation because the condition was more likely humid and not very arid. Okay, this was mostly the first part of my talk. And uh, I, I tried to give you some insight on climate condition and climate change during the first phase of the crisis. But now we jump on the, on the bottom condition or especially in the environmental condition. So we can try to get more information about the condition in which gypsum formed during the first phase of the crisis. So let's think about to make a diving from the seafloor to the water column and try to read the sedimentological, sedimentological or pedographic feature, the paleontological content, but also the meaning of some very specific molecular fossils. We start from the seafloor, and at the seafloor, we have the growing of gypsum deposits. And these gypsum deposits, deposit, if we compare them, you see these are the typical Messian gypsum deposits. If we compare them with the modern gypsum, so the most apparent thing is that the habit so the crystal habit is completely different. This is another story. So these are sample from a mother salina. We have the thicker gypsum sample that is around about seven to 10 centimeter thick. And in the Messina, we have up to meter thick gypsum or meter tall gypsum uh, sample. And these are, all the Messina are well twinned. You can see this the twinning plane. These are, um, very well developed at the light. This is the typical arrowhead or swallowtail shape of the crystal of the Messinian crystal. So the first consideration we can do is that we have ideal saturation for the modern gypsum sample growing in, as a, for example, in modern salina where ideal saturation produces more nucleation of crystal and so produces smaller crystals and probably lower super saturation for the Messinian one producing huge amount of gypsum, especially big crystals. But we have also other independent data like geochemistry data in the fluid inclusion, for instance, in the gypsum 
or in the fossil containing gypsum that we'll show you later, but also from the isotope and especially the hydrogen and the oxygen isotope of the crystallization water of gypsum that are pointing a very low salinity condition during the precipitation of this gypsum. Low means before, I mean, below the condition, the salinity of normal seawater. But today I will stick on the molecular fossil and try to get the information of what the, the, the info molecular fossil tell us about the poly condition or the poly information during, for the precipitation of these deposits. So if you look at this image, don't be worried about it, but this is a, a typical inventory of molecules in modern sediments. If you go in the persaline sediments, in modern persaline sediments, like we can, we can take it, like example, this uh, lagoon, persaline lagoon in Mexico. So the typical lipid that we can found in uh, persaline setting are lipid produced by cyanobacteria, like this, uh, like this kind of compound here, but also uh, lipids produced by archaea and especially allophilic archaea. So archaea tolerating or loving high salinity condition. And these are the typical cyanobacteria producer lipids. So the heptadecane is a kind of short chain and alkane. If we study the Messian gypsum, and here we have an example of this gypsum. So this gypsum deposit are completely different from the modern gypsum deposit, not only with the habit, but also from the lipid point of view, because you can see the modern gypsum is plenty of lipid produced by cyanobacteria, very abundant, but in the Messian gypsum, we almost don't have any typical lipid of cyanobacteria. And this opens a new perspective because you can see all these strange things inside the, the modern in the Messinian gypsum, this elongated feature. So this feature were first interpreted as cyanobacterial remains. But we ever reinterpreted this feature, this cylindrical feature, but very elongated. This feature are typical for the many Messinian the gypsum deposit, and they are called spaghetti-like structure because of the elongated shape, like in this case. But we have reinterpreted them as another type of bacteria, like sulfide oxidizing bacteria. So sulfide oxidizing bacteria today live in very different conditions, not only in shallow water, but also deep water, with the absence of oxygen in very low, uh, so very low oxygen conditions. And the first analysis of these, uh, these uh, filaments, and especially this dot all around the filament, allow us to interpret them as a remain of polysulfide. So this is a Raman spectrum, and uh, showing the presence in some of these black dot of polysulfide compounds. So the polysulfide are typical in modern, and you can see here, the modern sulfide oxidative bacteria. So if you spot again with the Raman spectra in all this bright point, the yellow one, you can see again the polysulfide presence. This is a typical feature of modern sulfide oxidizing bacteria like Vegeto. So if you believe that the Messinian gypsum is plenty of these filamentous fossils, so we can have some interpretation, not only, not uh, unfortunately, not for the depth of the position because these bacteria are found in many kinds of depth of basins, but we can say that at least gypsum did not form in the photic zone because these are not cyanobacteria. And at least we can say that during gypsum formation, there was a very active sulfur cycling. Okay, if we want to know about salinity, unfortunately, this filament doesn't tell us anything about salinity. So we have to look at another compound. And this compound are for instance, the, the compound produced by archaea, and one of them especially is archaeol. Again, we've stick at this name, sorry for this strange name, but the lipids are often so, so difficult to pronunciate and to understand, to comprehend like difficult uh, structure they have. But if you look at these archaeal compounds, so typical of hypersaline uh, or allophilic archaea, and you look at this uh, sediment that they are coming from the Guerrero Negro Lagoon. So these are a very shallow water and very persaline lagoon. Again, these sediments are completely full of these archaeal compound. So mostly, most likely, allophilic archaea will produce in the majority of this compound. 
we try to compare this data set with the Messinian and we try to study several samples across the Mediterranean basin. Sample of gypsum here, you can see, and there are similarity with the modern sample because Archeol, this purple color, is also present in the Messinian sample. But this, the association, the Archeol association of lipids is completely different from the modern sample because there are many more archaeal compounds found in the Messinian gypsum. And uh, another point is that today, allophilic archaea have been found also living or tolerating low salinity conditions. For instance, if we go into the Black Sea today, you can see on the bottom of the Black Sea, these white patches that are full of vegetal-like uh, microbial mats, these are the same organisms that we recognize in the gypsum. There are sulfide oxidizing bacteria. And all around this uh, white patch in the, the Black Sea, which the salinity is very low, is around about 20 ppt, so it's very, it's a kind of brackish condition, they have been found also some externophilia archaea, so loving, loving the typical uh, salt, ter, salt tolerating uh, archaea the same compound that we have found in the Messinian gypsum. So again, what I want to say that this combination of microbial association is very anomalous uh, for the Messinian, and we have to use with caution the archaeal lipid to interpret the uh, auto-reconstruct paleosalinity. And other information come from the water column compound. So if we want to look at the compound living in the water column, hmm, these are very abundant in the Messinian gypsum. Again, this is, sorry, this is a very difficult graphic maybe, but uh, this is a, a list of compounds found in the Messinian gypsum with their specific isotope, Delta C13 isotope. What I want to focus to make it simple is this are the compound produced by archaea. Again, I told you that there are in gypsum archaea typical of hypersaline condition like this one, this compound here, like archaeal, you see here, but there is also a group of compounds like this one that are typical of other kind of archaea. And this group of compounds, the GDGTs, I don't want to bore you with the strange names, these are mostly produced by plantic tamarchiota. So archaea living in plantic conditions, so in the water column, and these are mostly the most common archaean found in modern ocean, so in normal marine condition. So this is very strange to found this group of compounds in the Messian gypsum because these are absent in the modern hypersaline gypsum. So this makes us quite convinced that the Messian gypsum does not form in shallow hypersaline condition, but was quite deep condition forming these Messian crystals. Going on on the, for, on the type of uh, lip found and uh, in the gypsum that come from the water column, we also have another group of compounds that are produced by algae. And this group of compounds that are called commonly sterols indicate that the marine algae were most likely present during the formation of gypsum. And the most common compound found in gypsum is dinosterol, mostly produced by dinoflagellate and diatoms. This molecular fossil evidence is strongly supported by petrographic observation again, because if we look at the content, microfossil content within the gypsum, we recently found a lot of organic matter were preserved, like this cluster of aggregates very, with very high fluorescence. And these are, or these have been interpreted as aggregate of marine, as marine known flocculs. So these are evidence of primary productivity in the upper water column. But we can go also in far to the detail, and we recently found entrapped in the gypsum sample, so in the primary lower gypsum sample, a lot of diatom assemblage. And this is a recent study by our colleague Luca Pellegrino. And this, it found a lot of type of diatoms, both the normal plantic diatom like this catocheros, but also a lot of type of a nano-sized uh, plantic diatom. These plantic diatoms are very common in marine context, from brackish to normal marine conditions. And they are mostly 
um, forming the so-called deep chlorophyll chlorophyll maximum. So this the presence of this 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 kind of a, a well preserved diatom in Messinian gypsum that are well, excellently preserved indicate that gypsum grow very fast and trap these kind of uh, fossils and preserve all their <clears throat> the preserved their molecular fossil and gypsum formed with a very well developed deep chlorophyll maximum. So with the stratification of the basin. And another implication is that the production, the, the, uh, the, the amount of this kind of diatom that is very high in the gypsum together with the lipids suggest a very high carbon export and silic export during gypsum depositions. Okay, I would like to conclude uh, my talks. I'm, I'm almost finished it. And uh, I would like to conclude with a kind of graphical conclusion, summarizing step-by-step step what I we found, we found in, in the Messinian gypsum deposit. So we found a lot of analkane, long chain analkane in the gypsum, suggesting that there was a lot of input from terrestrial plants. And this input since is suggesting most likely uh, and a humid hydrological regime was produced by, was, was provided by a lot of riverine runoff during gypsum precipitation. Together with vegetational plants, nutrients were transported in the, in, in the, the Messinian basin. We are talking about the marginal Messinian basin, of course, but these nutrients were the base, were the food for a lot of marine algae like diatom or, di or dinoflagellate that were living in the upper water column. And after they died, they settling on the water, on the, on the sea floor, they were rapidly, uh, rapidly entrapped by the gypsum grow. And this is, suggest, this is suggesting a lot of carbon export during gypsum precipitation. So primary productivity and the trapment, entrapment on the, on, the gypsum, on the gypsum crystals. And another, Another interesting thing is the presence of planting archaea, so the tamarchiota that I, I just explained a few minutes ago. So this tamarchiota most likely live today uh, in stratified basin, but also in a not stratified basin, but in normal marine condition. And so the carbon export was most likely also influenced by blooming of this tamarchiotal um, microorganism, archaea. So what we have to do next for the future is to try to understand more the very fine lamination inside the gypsum crystal. So I talk uh, today. I talk. I, I talk about um, different type of cyclicity. So the long term cyclicity between the three phases of the crisis, the short term cyclicity, or the processional, uh, the processional cyclicity between the gypsum, the shales. Uh, at processional scale, so uh, um, uh, inside the primary lower gypsum units. But what still need to do, still to analyze, is the very fine lamination, so the very high frequency uh, cyclicity uh, inside the gypsum crystal. And you can see there are laminar rich organic matter and laminar uh, poor of organic matter, but uh, uh, plenty of gypsum because they are, uh, these are this part of transparent crystal. And in the organic matter, we have a lot of kind of contribution of microorganism or lipid biomarker entrapped in this lamina. So this open new question about the role of microorganism and the sulfur and the carbon cycle during gypsum precipitation. And this will be most like the next future for our research. So I concluded this way and uh, I thank you again to invite for inviting me, and I'm open to any kind of questions. Thank you, Marcello, uh, for the uh, fantastic uh, um, for the fantastic talk. Absolutely. Thank you, Nicholas. And, uh, and, um, and we open the podium for more questions from the public. Anybody has a question? I have a question. Yeah. Well, thank you for the presentation, uh, Doctor. It's a very nice uh, presentation, and I mean, it's opening my eyes to something new. And uh, 
can say molecular fossils are quite uh, interesting. Uh, but uh, my question, I mean, a couple of them anyway, I hope we, we have time, would uh, start from uh, when you talk about the hen akins, hen akins and the akinons, I, I was wondering if you actually focus more on the on the on the on the plants uh, molecular fossils. I, I I basically my question is, do they cohabit together with also the 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 animals like uh, the other molecular fossils you showed to us? Because one of the slides I saw there that you present more of the N arcane, it seems to me that. Uh, Maybe you are looking at N arcane alone and you don't have the, the other uh, molecular forces for the animals. Like maybe the algae's you just showed later in the screen. Do they cohabit together or you are just focusing on the N arcane's? I'm not sure if I understood uh, your question. So oh. you're asking if I have, um, I have an alkane, I present the N alkane, and these are mostly the long chain so the NLK, uh, I would say, between the, a chain leg between uh, 29 and 33 atom of carbon. I don't know if you are, next, I, you are confident with these uh, molecules. But anyway, the long, long molecules are produced by plants. So they produce this kind of molecules. And we found these molecules in the gypsum. But at the same time, in the same gypsum crystal, we found also molecules typical of other uh, eukaryotes or prokaryotes. So they can cohabit together, they can coexist together because they come from two different environments. So There's, the NLK NL comes uh, from the continent. There was like a... Okay. And the algae or the other uh, group of uh, organs producing other compounds that were living in the water mass. So altogether they settling down like the sediment settling down in the one basin and then you analyze everything in this crystal. Of course, you make a, you make a kind of a, a bulk analysis in a, in a sample that is more or less like 10 centimeter per 10 centimeter or even less. So if you want to be more, more accurate in climatic or seasonal fluctuation, you need to analyze lamina by lamina. And this is not very easy for liquid biomarker. Okay, okay, okay. I, I think I, I, I got that. Uh, I. But then I'm still like what you just said now, like it has to be uh, for the N arcane. It seems to me like the N arcane, which has the longer chains, seems to be more preserved. Like they stay preserved more compared to the to the other shorter chains, the eukaryotes and the the, the lower uh, the, the, the animals um, chain. Am I right? Yes, sure. The long, the long chain are well preserved, but not only well preserved. I think this is that these are more abundant than the short chain, and this is very common for uh, for our sample. We have because we are studying marginal basing, and when you are studying marginal basing, you have more input from the surrounding area, so the catchment area, and this very make very sense that you have more long chain alkane than the short one. I see. I see. And uh, maybe maybe uh, you would look at one of the slides you also presented. How does uh, the, the climate, I mean, I know it could affect the bioabundance of uh, the, the preserved fossils, but in terms of uh, the crisis of uh, mycelium salinity crisis, though, were they really significant? I mean, I'm talking of the climate because there's a particular slide you showed us about the arid and the humid condition. And it's still within the same gypsum, lower gypsum unit you, you showed. Yes. So I, 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 was the climate that significant that it affected? Because the other slide shows little, little of the end against, I mean, the preserved uh, fossils. Are they significant? This, the, I mean, you mean if the climate was uh, so significant to produce the gypsum? Perfect. Yes. No, the, the, the climate was significant to produce the gypsum, but I'm talking about the preservations of the, the N. Akins uh, fossils that we found there. 
Yeah, I think that uh, humid climate, you have more, produ more production of uh, long chain alkane, just because you have a humid vegetation, you have more runoff, river in runoff that put in the, in the basin or transport in the basin more molecules. Then we have the gypsum that we're growing very fast. Gypsum growing like an, is, a, is an evaporitic or is a kind of evaporitic uh, mineral. So it's very, it's growing really very fast. And this is a trapping and this is really preserving very well the organic compounds. So what is strange to my point of view, and we have a several, as I told, several lines of evidence that during the first phase of the crisis, we have more evidence like paleontological, geochemical, and uh, in some cases also paleobotanical evidence, because we, there are colleagues of us that found uh, leaves of humid plants inside the gypsum. So we have evidence of humid condition during gypsum precipitation. And this is not a very, what uh, some uh, one will, uh, will expect, you know, because uh, generally gypsum will, will Yes. Should, should be produced, we should form it during more hard condition. But if we look, look in more detail in the short term, we see some changing in vegetational. If you remember, I show NLK from the shale and from the gypsum, we are in the same range of humid plants, but there is a shift in the humid plants. So I, I cannot tell you which plants produce the different compounds, but there is a sort of shift. And this shift is recorded by the delta C13 carbon isotope of enalkane. Okay. Yeah. I, I, try, I, I hope okay. I, I answered your questions. Yes, you, you did, you did, you did. I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, eye open and uh, learning more from this. Uh, I'll leave the ground for others to ask questions. I still have one yeah. more, but let other people ask questions. Exactly, Gabriel, thank you very <laughs> I much. I think we more. need to... I think we need to leave the others. And we have one in the chat. I'll um, type it that way. Yeah, so I will read it for you. Uh, Pasha is asking um, the delta C that um, you used to determine the type of vegetation are delta C13 leaf wax, meaning C29, C31, and C33. Question. If not, then don't you think the, the Delta C13 leaf wax are better indicators of changes in vegetation? Yes, it's, uh, it's exactly what I, I try to, to figure out. So in my, in my data set, I just present the mostly the C29 and C31. So we have a different, uh, for the expert, we, we have a, a very slightly ever chain length. So the ever chain length is a proxy evidencing how much you have of the single compound. And uh, so we don't think that there is a, a very strong change in vegetations because uh, these are, I mean, the pixel, the difference between C29 and C31 are very tiny. But what is changing more is the Delta C13. So I think it's more like that uh, the same type of vegetation was more adapted to different or try to be adapted to different climatic regime. So I, I don't know if I, I reply to your question, but I think um, this is what uh, we are thinking about. So again, it's very intriguing because if you compare the molecular fossil with the uh, entire leaves, so plant remains, the plant remains show that we have input from continent and these plants are typical of humid regime or humid climate. And again, we, we can see something more because we'll see a lot of lipids and these lipids show also a kind of uh, changing in their Delta C13. So we think that there is a change, but not a really an extreme change between humid and arid, but still in the range of humid condition. Okay, well, I, I hope you ask, you answer his question. He, he, I don't see any, um, any reaction. Um, and and there is Kate, a thumb I, up. Yeah. There is a thumb ah, up. Okay, cool, you saw it. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Um, more questions from the audience? No question. Yeah, go ahead. No, no question. No questions in the, in the room. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I, if there are no questions, I think we, we can close up this session. 
And again, Marcello, really, for me, it was really enlightening. And I also learned new things about the Sicilian salinity crisis that, as you know, many of us at the University of Haifa are, are studying as well. Yeah. So thank you very much again. And I just wanted to wonder if you want to be um, in the mailing list for our seminars. Yes, please. It would be very interesting. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate. Anyway, and, if uh, uh, someone someone has other question in the audience, or they will come with other question later on, you have my email, and you can just transfer to me. Exactly. And uh, well, next week we're staying in Italy. By the way, we're moving mm -hmm. not so close, not so far from you, from Torino to Milano. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. So stay tuned and I will send you also the information, Marcello. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Okay. Thank you very much to everybody and see you next week.